Hi everyone, welcome to my presentation. My name is Bert Slesser and I'm from Georgian College. I work in the Center for Teaching and Learning as a faculty developer. And the topic today that I'm going to be talking to you about is low tech trust. So specifically low tech trust strategies to help humanize your students virtual learning experience. So before we get going, we're going to start with a, a little activity. It's called Who Do You Trust? And there's going to be three images per slide here in the next three slides and I just want you to rank them you know one to three uh, you know one being the most trustworthy and three being the least it's a I know it's asynchronous but uh, we'll try and get some engagement going all right here we go so who do you trust and that third image there uh, represents uh, maybe an independent you know, coffee shop that you really like. Okay, next slide here. All right, so here we go, last one. It's kind of a bonus question, all right? Okay, so a picture of me, family photo, some scruffy, scruffy dude with a beard, or a gentleman with a COVID mask. Now, if you're clever and you kind of get the joke here that actually all three of these pictures are, uh, are of me. So it's, a bit, it's just a bit of a joke, but uh, you get me on the left, a family photo camping, you know, camping trip, and then me uh, trying out a new COVID mask. So the point here is, that I'm trying to make is that trust is complex. You know, who, what, or why you trust. Um, it's going to be different. It's going to be, it's not going to be the same for every single person. You know, there'll be some of us that have a real brand loyalty, for example. Uh, other, others, you know, we're powered by a sense or some kind of a vibe. Um, and this can be about a person. Uh, also, you know, we look at the quality uh, and consistency, uh, maybe reliability of a service. So trust is a very complex. So um, when I think of trust, you know, it's, it's, we are trying to create a personal connection here uh, through a very impersonal medium. And trust is a very multi-layered characteristic of any relationship, be it personal, professional, with a student, um, political. <laughs> uh, and I think, you know, we can establish trust, in my personal opinion, within minutes. It takes a long time for it to grow, but I think we base it on a sense. So trust appears also to be driven by a sense of what to do rather than a conscious determination. I like that, um, that we look at a person's reliability and their honesty and whether or not they actually care about us. Um, and that can be, you know, used uh, with an organization as well. So my question for you today was, you know, how do we as educators elicit trust from our students in our virtual environment and how does trust have a humanizing impact on how we teach. So I'm going to answer these questions uh, sequentially. I'll, I'll look at the first part, how do we as educators elicit trust from our students? And I'm going to break it down into sort of six points. Um, and I look at, you know, we as leaders of the classroom to exhibit trust. Um, so I'm going to look at honesty, reliability, kindness, um, planning, consistency, and then vulnerability. Vulnerability can also be looked at as a kind of openness. All right, so here we go. Uh, the first point here is gonna be about honesty. All right, be honest with your students about who you are and, and your interactions with them. And you'll notice that this slide, okay, it's about me, um, really has nothing to do with content. And that, it's nothing to do with math or engineering or health sciences or computer studies. Remember that students are powered by a sense of who you are. They want to know, are you human? You know, do you have a life outside of, of work? So let me demonstrate this for a second. Uh, I will go through the slide as if I was going through it in class. All right, here's a picture of Eleanor on the left. Uh, Eleanor is my, my dog, German Shepherd there. Uh, below it is uh, Chewy, that's my cousin's dog. And my wife and I love to go for hikes with Eleanor. We, we take her, um, out in, the, out in the forest and go for walks and whatnot all the time. The picture in the center, that was me at a bike race. Uh, my wife and I last year, last fall, competed in an eight-hour tag team race and we had a blast. Um, the last photo there is of some apples that my uh, family and I picked and uh, 
we had a great time. Every year, annually, my parents love to make apple cider. So uh, these apples actually came from my parents' property. So it was pretty cool. Okay, end of demonstration. You know, be honest about who you are. Like, take a second. It doesn't need to be real in-depth. Um, but also be honest about, you know, if you make any mistakes, whether that's, you know, your timelines, your syllabus, your marking. I really believe that students, they may dislike your mistakes, but they really respect your honesty. And I think that goes a long way. Reliability. You know, do your best to establish your reliability and communicate your expectations. Students really want someone who is reliable. And remember that reliability is going to look different depending on the professor. So the image that you see here on the screen is an excerpt. Uh, I pulled this from uh, uh, another professor from, from Georgian. And when I reached out to people and I said, you know, what does trust look like in your classroom? What does reliability look like in your classroom? And they, I got different responses, and this was one of them, and I thought this is great. You know, how will you support your students' development? You know, it's a simple question. How can you be reliable in that way? And reliability also looks like, you know, are you on time? You know, some simple little things like that. I remember a professor in my, you know, university days that was, you know, sometimes on time, sometimes not, sometimes there, sometimes not. Uh, sometimes you could reach them by email. Sometimes you couldn't. So however you want to display reliability, just make sure that it's, it's manageable. Set those expectations at, up at the beginning and be clear you know, by stating how you will be reliable, whether that's through your syllabus, your you know, Blackboard or Canvas or wherever your, whatever your uh, learning management system is, um, whether it's through a video, but make that bond with your group. Try and make it right away. Try and say, hey, I'm going to be reliable for you. So this next slide is about kindness and, and focused attention and micro signals. How do we how do we show kindness? So this is specifically about uh, your synchronous sessions, and I would say that it's really easy to say that um, that first image. I would probably have a hard time trusting that that person on the screen. I can't see his face. Well, it's obviously it's of me, but I can't see my face. Can't see read my facial expressions. And for this slide, I actually pulled. Uh, from the Journal of Surgical Education, and they did a study uh, since COVID uh, about patient and physician uh, interactions in, in, a, in a virtual uh, space. And they said that you know a hidden face with limited it will limit your interactions with the patient. So in this case, I'm applying it to a student. And a hidden face was also distracting. That would have been better to have a telephone appointment, which I thought was really interesting as well. So in this case, I think you know. You know, grab a ring light. You know, they're 20 bucks online or maybe more, but you can get some some inexpensive ring lights. You know, I'm a bit pale here, so you might not want to put your face directly in front of a, a window, but uh, try to do your best to, uh, to to light your face. Let them see you properly, and that that will help. Body movement is the next one. Can you guess what I'm thinking here? Can you guess what I'm doing here? So again, in the, this journal I, I picked up, uh, Surgical Education, they talked about how these small body movements can just be really distracting, that it can just make your audience think that, hey, you're not really listening or maybe you don't care. So it's important to say, um, so if the first image there, I'm actually thinking, will my dog attack the male person? All right, because my dog loves to go for the male person. The, the second image is I'm just taking notes. So be sure to narrate, annotate what you're doing. Sometimes it takes just a few little sentences to say, hey, this is just what I'm doing. I'm still listening. And that body movement sends good signals of I'm paying attention. The third point here of silence. I'm just looking at my second monitor in this image. But silence, as much as you think that, and we're taught that to be silent, to show empathy and to comfort uh, people, that sometimes that doesn't always work the same way in a virtual uh, space and that sometimes we need to uh, just say, hey, look, I'm listening, good point, and continue to annotate or narrate um, and build uh, confidence in that student. So sometimes when you're giving silence, you, you maybe need to just say a little bit more. Okay, planning for success. What does this look like? So we're in a new normal. 
And uh, so I'm going to phrase this point in a different way. And I know this is kind of an idealistic way to look at things, but we're not commuting anymore. Okay. Or some of us are not. We're not faced with the same group of crowds. We're not paying for parking. We're not trying to find a parking spot anymore. And we get to work from the comfort of our own home and kind of customize our own experience. And I think of we as educators, we have all of a sudden an opportunity to really uh, create an environment for diverse learning. So some of the points I thought about when, I'm, when I think of planning, I think planning for trust, I think, wow, we can really customize our synchronous sessions. So for example, one of the professors I talked to, uh, this is specific if you're teaching multiple sections of the same class, uh, this professor actually set up open synchronous sessions that any one of her classes that were the same course, but maybe different groups on different days, uh, they could just drop in on during the week at these different sessions that, that this person set up. So it wasn't just designated to, you know, Monday's class or Friday's class, but they could interchange. And I know that doesn't work for everyone, but it's an opportunity that we can, you know, think of how you can replan your class. What does that look like? The other part is, is group intimacy. I know a lot of professors that want breakout rooms, but sometimes the technology doesn't always work in our favor. I'm suggesting, you know, why don't we just do some staggered small groups? I know that might be too low tech or it might take up too much of your time, but I, I think you can do some focused time, stagger some of those sessions, and it gives you the insurance that you're connecting with everybody. And if you, you know, whether you're attaching marks to it or not, I think it just gives you an opportunity to create some group intimacy. The third point here is that, hey, guess what? All of a sudden we've moved from a class where you can barely, you know, get everyone's name to a spot where all of their names are on their pictures now within a synchronous session. I think this is fantastic. That way I can create a bit more of a personal connection and really connect with that student. You have the chance of getting immediate feedback and in some things uh, like, you know, for example, WebEx, we have the opportunity to give uh, private feedback to students and you can do that immediately. So that's a, another uh, great positive. And then as well as we have access to content one-on-ones, um, you have so much flexibility and I think it just gives us so much room to really plan for success. We can trust in behaviors that are consistent, even when those behaviors are, you know, consistently threatening because the consistency provides a backdrop for trust to develop. When I think of consistency, I, I always tell professors, build a consistent practice. What does that look like? Well, you know, keep your asynchronous material consistent. So if you're setting up due dates, you know, I recommend keeping those, you know, every, you know, Monday, for example, I had a due date. That was it, every Monday. They knew that through it the whole semester and that really helped them. You know, I also did tasks where they kind of frequently had to do similar things, but different content that also helped. There's discussion boards, there's chunking your lesson. However you build your course, you do what is gonna work for you, but try and keep it consistent. Remember that these students are all learning new technologies probably more than what we are. Um, so keep whatever you're doing consistent. I think it really helps. Gauge the temperature of your room. I always like to say use the first 10 minutes to develop a rapport with your students. Uh, sometimes you can say, hey, look, I'm gonna push you today. We're gonna do a lot of work. And if they're up for it, then boom, we push them. We get them to do it. And uh, sometimes you need to push them a bit more. Uh, but other days, you know, if the temperature of the room is, wow, you know, we got stacked up with midterms, it's maybe not the day to really push. So, but giving that consistency at the beginning of the class really helps. Formative feedback, whether you're doing review, quizzes, one-on-ones, you can do this uh, at the start of your session or at the end or build it within your asynchronous practice, students appreciate it. It helps them prep and remember and, and just be more uh, uh, you know, knowledgeable about the content you're trying to get across to them. So give, give formative feedback. And the last point is kind of uh, you know, sensitive, but your attitude and your tone, you know, I think that can go a long way in terms of the consistency. And when I think of this, sometimes I think of other things like deadlines and academic integrity. You know, I know some professors that are, you know, of the attitude that says, you know, a deadline is a deadline and that's okay. You know, if that's your style and that's where you're firm, then keep that consistency. 
And once students know that, then they'll be more prepared. But if you're flexible and you say, look, there's, you know, extenuating circumstances that where I'm going to be flexible, then leave it at that. I know one professor right now that's keeping, you know, some of their work more exploratory. And I think that uh, that's an interesting point to kind of, you know, any new tech that they get involved in is they're going to do it from a, an exploratory perspective and less evaluative. So that's a consistent way of helping your students get through uh, some new learning curves. My last point here is vulnerability. Also think of this as a kind of openness, but I'm going to talk about it through anecdotal dialogue. Uh, this point is hard to teach. You know, I'm going to talk about personal narratives, specifically professional personal narratives and shared life lessons, I believe, are opportunities to be vulnerable. And I really believe that vulnerability can open the door to establishing some trust with your group. I recommend shifting more towards a professional narrative and I will give you an example. So I'm going to talk about one of my mistakes that I made uh, as a teacher. Uh, so I'm going to jump into a demonstration here and I'm going to be vulnerable before you. So when I was lecturing in, in class, I, uh, a student uh, was playing music over my lecture and I stopped the class and I said, hey, you know, whoever's playing the music, can you please turn it down? And so the music went away. Uh, you know, I kept lecturing and then another, you know, a few minutes went by and, and I could hear the music pop back up again. And so I stopped the class a second time, but this time I was more irritated and I said, you know, whoever's playing the music, can you please turn it off? It's, it's really disrupting the class. And so the music went away. But sure enough, the third time, uh, the music came back. And this time I was, I was really irritated. <laughs> and I lit into my students. I was a bit of a jerk. And I just say, you know, whoever's playing the music, can you turn it off or you leave, you know, get out of here. And uh, you could hear a pin drop. There was nothing. And it's just, out of the corner of my eye, I could see a hand go up. And this, you know, small young lady, petite you know, first year student raises her hand and she says, uh, sir, sir, um, could it be your music? And uh, all of a sudden I realized and I felt that flushness that comes into your face when you've realized you're embarrassed. And uh, I suddenly realized that it, it was my music and uh, I had left it uh, playing um, from the beginning of the class when I was running some kind of an icebreaker activity. And uh, yeah, it was me. And uh, in that moment, I had to be honest. So that's kind of an honesty moment for me. Um, and they laughed. They had a, a great laugh at my expense. But that story, okay, that professional narrative um, opens up some anecdotal dialogue between, you know, if this was a synchronous session, we'd be able to talk about it. Um, but it gave us an opportunity or gives you guys an opportunity, um, my audience here, to see that, hey, I'm, I'm fallible. Uh, and I hope people know that and that hopefully makes uh, me some ways more trustworthy. So trust is sort of that grounding principle to lean on and I think these you know six strategies help elicit trust in your classroom and if you can do that I also think we're going to answer the second part of that question. How do we humanize? How does this humanize the learning environment? Well, I think it creates a kind of shared values. When people feel like they can be honest and that there's this consistency in the classroom and kindness, then I really think it's going to create a sense of belonging. People feel like they can participate, that diversity is welcomed, and that there is a sense of citizen power. And I think that that humanizes the learning environment. Without good communication and trust, I really believe it's difficult for any team to function effectively, particularly a remote one. I really agree with this quote. So my question here for you, I'm going to leave you with this question. Despite all our technological advancements, trust, I really believe, is imperative. And I think in a time of uncertainty, we need trust. I think we're inundated with technology, so we need some low-tech options. So my question for you that I'm going to let you reflect on is what does low tech trust look like in your virtual classroom? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you for the test organizers. Uh, that was great. And uh, I appreciate people listening to my presentation and taking that time. Uh, and if you want to contact me in a low tech way, uh, there is my email address. All right. Thank you very much.